The strict father is the decider, a phrase you may have heard. Right? That is, there is no authority in the family higher than the strict father. Okay? Now, when you apply this to government by the nation as family, it says that people who are poor deserve to be poor and shouldn't be helped. In fact, they should be made to be disciplined more. You should withhold help or else you'll be coddling them. Right? So that's one thing that's said. Secondly, it said, that says that there should be no authority higher than the strict father. Now, what does this say about markets? Have you ever, ever heard the expression, let the market decide? It says the market is the decider. The market rewards and punishes. Right? So the market is the strict father because the market is moral, knows right from wrong. The market is supposed to be the moral system because in the market, if everybody pursues their own interests, the interests of all will be maximized. It's a moral system. And it's a natural system, like the family. So the market is seen as the strict father here. And that means that there should be no authority above the market. That means the government should not be an authority above the market, which means four things. No regulation. No taxation. Taxes should be cut, except to help the market. Okay. There should be no unionization or worker rights, and there should be no tort cases you know, uh, where you can sue a company. Okay? Those are the four things that where, where something, there would be an authority over the market. Got it? You can begin to see the reasoning behind this when you apply a strict father model of the family to the nation and to the market. Very, very important. And it says that each person should be pursuing their self-interest in the market. That this is about competition. And competition is good because it makes you disciplined. A lack of competition takes your discipline away. Okay? So individuals, individual people, should have to compete with each other. Not cooperate, but compete. And that's good because it makes them disciplined. That's part of conser the conservative moral system. What does that say about empathy? Not there. Not present. In the progressive moral system, it's based on empathy. In a, progress in, 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 a in a nurturing parent family, what does it mean? It means you are nurturing your child. You have to empathize with your child. You have to know what all those cries mean. You have to communicate. In addition, you have a responsibility. You're responsible for yourself. You can't take care of someone else if you're not taking care of yourself and for your children and your family. And you have to make your, your child, and your, your job is to raise your child to be a nurturer of others, which means they have to have empathy toward others and have responsibility for themselves and others. It's the opposite of indulgence. But to conservatives, it is indulgence. <laughs> Conservatives misconstrue this in terms of indulgence. They can't tell the difference. Right? Now, this turns out to be important in many, many ways, and we'll see this as we go along. But there's uh, a little thing I didn't mention about mirror neurons, which connect you to other people. In the premotor cortex, right next to the mirror neuron section, about that far away, you know, a few millimeters away. There's another part of the premotor cortex which has what are called canonical neurons. Very bad name. But here's what they mean. These neurons fire when you perform an action or you can see something you perform it on. You know, so I can drink the coffee or I can see the coffee there. Same neurons are firing. Very crucial. Okay. Why? Those neurons connect you to the physical world. And they connect you to the environment, and the mirror neurons connect you to other animals. You have a physical basis for your connection to the physical world. Okay? And that can be strengthened or weakened over time. But there's a physical basis for it. Okay? That is the basis of, of an environmental morality and environmental ethic. 
and it has to be learned. It has to be something, it's not just, I mean, you have it there as you, you're born with it, but if you never experience the physical world or you have something to keep you from valuing it, then that can deteriorate. So one of the things you have to learn and enrich is your connection to the physical world, which is physical. Very important in education and in everything people do. Okay? And that is the basis of an environmentalist morality. You know, it's there in your bodies. Okay? Import, very important thing to, to recognize. Now, uh, there's a further thing you need to know about the brain. Uh, when you have two systems of thought, you can have two contradictory systems of thought in the same brain and two contradictory moral systems in the same brain. And there's a reason for it. Your brains are not consistent. They have a property called mutual inhibition. That is, the activation of one circuit can inhibit the f firing of another, and vice versa. And you see this all the time. Imagine uh, the morality on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Right? Yeah. People work one way Saturday night, another way Sunday morning, don't even notice the difference. The, contents, the content activates one or the other in context. And the different moral systems apply to different things. Partying on Saturday night, going to church and being pious on Sunday morning. That is, all right, how does that work? The moral systems work by neural binding. Neural binding is a mechanism in the brain that links things together. And it says, this, you, you think this way about these issues and these situations and that way about these issues and those situations. That is why there are people, a lot of people, who are conservative about some things and progressive about others. That is normal, happens all the time. So the question then is, uh, what things are conservatives, people who see themselves as conservatives, what do they tend to be progressive about? Is there any tendency? And one of the things that they're often progressive about is the environment. And this is important for people who like to go, conservatives like to go fishing or hunting or camping or hiking, and there are lots of them, or people who like live in beautiful places and love the land. They have a physical connection to their environment, but they don't use the word environment. They don't use the word ecology, right? They don't talk about wetlands, they talk about swamps. <laughs> okay? They have a different way of thinking about their environment and of talking about it. There's a different language about it. You know, progressives talk about wetlands, you know, <laughs> the conservatives talk about swamps and, and so on with all sorts of other terms. They also talk about the land. And so if you're talking to conservatives and you want to evoke their progressive side, you talk about the land and what they do with the land and whether they find it beautiful and what they find beautiful about it. Right? How do progressives talk to conservatives? There's a very simple technique. You ask them what they care about and how they act on that care. And it turns out that most conservatives care about something that you also care about. And the question is, what are those things? What do they share with you? And, they're la and you want to have them talk about it to get their language, not your language. Right? So it's important to understand that when you have people who are conservative, they're not necessarily enemies of the environment. They just you know, may see the, envir the, the environmental vocabulary as foreign or as opposed to their vocabulary. Right? Very important thing to know about, there's a term for this, it's called biconceptualism. You have two different conceptual systems. Right? And you need to be aware of, of how that's working with whoever you're talking to. Okay. Now, uh, given all of this stuff,